Two Chairs No Waiting, episode number 450. Mayberry Halloween to you. <laughs> Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you by weaversdepartmentstore.com. Drop by Weavers and check out the 2018 calendar while you can. <laughs> Or maybe a sheriff's badge is something you'd like. Drop by weaversdepartmentstore.com and support this podcast. Two Chairs No Waiting is also brought to you by donations from listeners just like you. The executive producer of episode number 450 is Phil Barnard. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Two Chairs No Waiting. I am your host for this special edition of Halloween, Mayberry Halloween to you. (laughs) This episode, we're going to have Randy Turner is going to give us some information about Halloween. about the golden arm. So if you're afraid, gather around your friends and keep them close. (laughs) You're going to need them there. But first, let's go hear from our friend, Randy Turner. Welcome to This Week in Mayberry History, a report by special correspondent Randy Turner of the Gomer and Cooper Pyle Comic Book Literary Guild of the Mayberry Historical Society. While the Andy Griffith Show never had an episode specifically centered on Halloween, it did make references to the holiday occasionally and had several episodes whose subject matter fit the mood perfectly. In the 1964 episode, Back to Nature, Andy told the story of the Golden Arm to Opie and his friends around a campfire, though Barney and Gomer were just as enthralled as the children. And of course, Alan has told the story before as part of this podcast. The story is a folk tale that has been documented in at least a similar form to that told by Andy and Alan more than 200 years ago, but its oral tradition is much older. The story was originally meant to remind listeners to be respectful of the dead. And as such, many different countries have their own versions. Even in the United States, there are variations, such as a corpse coming back from the dead for a golden leg or even a toe. But the golden arm is the most prevalent version. The aspect of the arm being made of gold illustrates the shift in the story not just being about respecting the dead, but also warning against avarice, since greed is what propels the survivor to keep the arm. The version most people know was the subject of an essay by Mark Twain in his book, How to Tell a Story and Other Essays. Twain honed his telling of the tale while on a tour giving readings of his work in 1884 and 1885. He later wrote that he had first heard the story from Uncle Daniel, a slave that had belonged to Twain's uncle. Three Wishes for Opie is also appropriate for the season. The story itself concerns Barney's belief that the spirit of a long-deceased European count could be summoned with a magic lamp and that wishes would be granted by the spirit. This is a variation on the more common cautionary story of a character who has granted a wish and actually gets the wish only to find out that the desired reality is not what they had thought it would be and then pays a price for interfering with fate. One of the more famous examples can be found in The Monkey's Paw, a 1902 English horror story in which three wishes are granted to the owner of a mummified monkey's hand. 
When the protagonist rather flippantly wishes for 200 pounds to pay off his mortgage, the next day, his son is killed in a factory accident, with the employer denying responsibility by giving the grieving father 200 pounds out of goodwill. And the consequences get more hellish when 10 days later, he wishes his son, who was mutilated in the accident and has been buried for more than a week, back to life. Just so you can sleep tonight, he used his third and final wish to undo his second wish when there was a knock at his door after his son's corpse had shambled back home. That version is far too bleak for Mayberry, but the scene of Barney, Floyd, and Goober summoning the Count fits the holiday and is priceless. Finally, the haunted house is an obvious episode befitting Halloween. While Barney and Gomer are as scared as children when investigating the old Rimshaw place, level-headed Andy ultimately solved the mystery. On the actual 40 acres back lot, the Rimshaw house stood right beside Andy's and was seen other times without the set dressing that made it look abandoned. That building facade can actually be seen in Gone with the Wind as Aunt Pity Pat's house. A lot of the streets of Atlanta set were burned down for the burning of Atlanta scene in the movie, but the old Rimshaw place was spared. When Don Knotts left the Andy Griffith show to do movies, it was Andy who suggested the concept to be expanded, eventually resulting in the ghost of Mr. Chicken. But that's it for this week. As always, remember to take Andy's advice and go out there and act like somebody. <laughs> this week in Mayberry History with Randy Turner, you don't want to miss it. He also does a daily version of it, if you're still around. If you'd like to make sure you don't miss one, you can go to turnersgrade at gmail.com. Mm. So I hope you enjoyed that bit of Mayberry fun. <laughs> oh, the music stopped. It's time now to sit back and listen and prepare yourself for the story of who stole my golden arm. This story's been around for over 200 years. And tonight we're going to hear yet another version of Who Stole My Golden Arm. And I hope you're going to enjoy it. So sit back. If there's children in the house, you may want to move them around or sit close to them and let them hold on to you as we hear Who Stole My Golden Arm. Once upon a time, there was a very, very rich man. He lived in a great big house on top of a misty mountain. He was so rich that people would travel up the winding road that led up to his house and ask him to do favors for him, maybe donate some money. Children would go up there to his door and they try to peddle their cookies and candy bars and magazine subscriptions for school. But even more often, parents would arrive with their daughters in tow, knowing that this rich man was not married. They hoped he'd fall helplessly in love with their daughters. He turned away the children and that was despite all the wonderful goodies they had to offer. And likewise, he turned away all the fair women, many of which were young and beautiful. He turned them all away because he believed that no one was really interested in him. 
that all they really were interested in was his money and his big house on the hill. One day, a woman arrived at his door. She wasn't looking for money or for love. She simply needed some directions. He was suspicious, but after listening to her tales of getting lost, he found himself most captivated by her arm. It was her golden arm. He invited her in for tea and she must have been very thirsty after such a long and lost travels. He would give her the direction she needed and curiosity got the best of him and he wanted to know more about the golden arm of hers. So over a glass of tea, she told him how she had been born the daughter of the richest man in the land a man even richer than himself. Now she had been in a terrible horseback riding accident as a little girl and riding the horse that her father had given her and her father felt terrible. When she lost her arm, she cried and cried and cried. Who would ever fall in love with a one-armed girl? How would she ever tend to a home and to a husband and to a child with only one arm? Her tears of pain and loss only made her father's guilt grow. So when she was a young lady, her father gave her a gift of the golden arm. It was made of the finest gold in the world and made to look exactly like her arm, but of solid gold. Her father told her that no one, no thing, no accidents, no horses could ever take that arm away from her. It was her golden arm. Entertained by her tale of the golden arm, the man gave her directions that she needed, then invited her back for tea the next day. Day after day, they enjoyed afternoon tea together, and eventually they married. He thought no man was as fortunate as blessed and as lucky as he. Then suddenly, one day, his wife died. So, not long after his beloved wife had been buried, he grabbed a shovel because he had realized that while he was saddened and he did love his wife, he knew he loved her golden arm more than he ever loved her. She had been buried with that golden arm. So after A while after she had been buried, he grabbed that shovel and made his way to her gravesite of his beloved wife. He began to dig. With each dig of the shovel into the dirt that covered his wife's grave, he thought to himself, Oh, that golden arm. I must have that golden arm. I'm going to get that golden arm. He dug and he dug. 
And eventually, he found her and her golden arm. Covered in dirt, her face was her face was so pale. In the moonlight, her lips were ashy. Oh, but that golden arm. It glistened and it shined. It was so bright and still so beautiful. He reached in and grabbed it out. And he quickly began to cover his dead wife with the fresh dirt that he had piled up. All the while, he was thinking to himself, <laughs> I have the golden arm. I got it. I finally got the golden arm. He covered the grave with the dirt so it looked like it had never been dug up to begin with. Made it look just like nothing had happened. He grabbed that golden arm and he ran through the cemetery and through the woods and up the dark hillside through the fog back to his great big house. He took that golden arm and hid it in a secret safe. It was a safe that no one else had ever known about, not even his beloved wife. After all his hard work digging and his wild uphill running through the fog, he found himself exhausted. He sat down in his chair, the chair he always sat in in the afternoon, right after tea, and he fell asleep. But he awoke to some kind of a sound. Who's come on a golden arm? was startled by the ghostly vision of his dead wife standing right before him. Who's got my golden arm? Her skin was so pale. He was terrified. Who's got my golden arm? They were ashen and gray. Could it really be her? Who's got my golden arm? Her hair is all clumped with fresh dirt. Could she be alive? Who's got my golden arm? Who's got my golden arm? Who's got my golden arm? You've got my golden arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's the story of a golden arm. Mm. I hope you enjoyed that story. It's always fun to tell. Feel free to share it with somebody else. Maybe even tell it around the campfire, 
<laughs> I'm sure it's going to keep Barney and Gomer awake all night. But is it going to keep you? <laughs> I hope not. We'll see you next time. I'm two chairs, no waiting. If you can make it there. <laughs>